Lama would speak in Tibetan, and that would then be translated into English, so I heard another language. And from English then, one of the Western monks who I was with would translate into Thai for me. So, one day sana, three languages. And it was, a, it was a bit strange, I must admit, because, you see, we were there and it was a Buddhist assembly, although we were in England, but we're all Buddhists, we're Theravadan Buddhist monks, and there are the Tibetan Buddhists, and we all share many of the similar external ways of uh, behavior. Our sila, our virtue is pure, we sit in a restrained way. And um, we bowed uh, to the shrine and bowed to the Dalai Lama, everything was, was normal. But then uh, as, as the Dalai Lama began to teach the Dhamma, then any time he made a point or some Dhamma observation or a comment that uh, the Westerners approved of, they would show their appreciation by clapping their hands and cheering and whooping, a bit like at a football crowd, football stadium. So uh, that was a bit shocking for me and it was a closed hall so that the noise was quite loud. So that was... That was my experience, just to share one experience of a, of a three-language Dhamma Desana with clapping and cheering. Puja to puja nianang, venerating those worthy of veneration. In Buddhism, there are two types of puja, or of uh, paying homage. Pati, pati puja, the way of uh, venerating through our practice, and what we call amisa puja. Amisa means material objects or material veneration. They're both good, but they are different. So first, Amisa Puja, material offerings. So for example, today, the lay community have brought food, lots of different requisites, different tasting food, some Thai, Central Thai, Isan, Western, Malay. But all these food from different places with different tastes and flavors it's all for the same thing. The purpose is to ward off hunger. Other types of material offerings are flowers, incense, or these woolly hats and socks that you bring us to ward off cold. These are all different types of amisa puja, material offerings. And these are all good. But higher than that, higher still, is pati pati puja. If you've managed to make offerings with the material things, then it's still not complete. The higher puja or the highest offering is with our practice. And that means cultivating virtue, uh, wholesome states of mind. So, to sum it up, in a word, panya means wisdom. Without wisdom, it's very easy for our minds and our lives to get stirred up and agitated. But first we need sata. Many people say, we we'll translate sata as belief. They say to have sata is to have belief. But, but it's deeper than that. Sata is a specific kind of belief, usually translated as faith. But you could, you could define it as belief or faith in those things that it's truly appropriate to have faith in or to believe in. So it means not just going by tradition. We have to use our wisdom faculty to investigate, to know what are the causes, what are the conditions that lead to certain results until we understand the principles of the Noble Eightfold Path. And this can be said to be the dawning of right view, which brings an end, which dispels darkness. This dawning of right view can be compared to the brightening of the sky in the east at the end of a long night. This is the forerunner, the harbinger of the dawn, and we know that sunrise is on the way and darkness will be dispelled. And a, a pun in Thai, with the arrival of panya is the ending of panha. Panha means problems. So with panya, you have no problems. And so sata, or faith, or belief, is belief in those things that will lead to panya. Panya, wisdom, is the foundation, it's the root 
of, of our investigation. All our investigation has to be grounded in Banya. So with regard Pati Pati Puja, making offerings through Pati Pati or practice Pati Bat in Thai, it's not, not important where we come from. We're all the same. Whether we're from Malaysia, Indonesia, Europe, Thailand, and all the, the monks, all the Kruba Ajans, we're what's called um, relatives in the Dhamma. We are relatives in the Triple Gem. In the world, we talk about blood relatives. We might say, he's my blood relative. But if people are just blood relatives, they're just related through by, by being family, you'll see often when they sit around together or do things together, it's often not very harmonious. Because you need to be both blood relatives and Dhamma relatives. See, if we see the truth of nature, we'll see that we're all the same. We all, actually, we're all, everybody in the world comes from the same village. What village do we all come from? We come from the village, the name is called Birth. And everybody who, who, who comes from the village of Birth actually lives in the same district. The district is called Old Age. So we're all born in Birth, which is in the district Old Age. And the... Uh, Amper, we have entire, a larger, sub, a larger district, is called sickness. So we're all from birth, old age, sickness, and the province that sickness is in is death. Dangwat death, or... And ultimately, it's in the, we could call it the land or the nation that we all live in is the cemetery or the graveyard. So we're all from the same place, we're, we're from, from birth, which is in old age, which is in sickness, and ultimately death in the land of the graveyard. And when we see this, we'll really see just how we're all the same. We're relatives in Buddha, relatives in Dung, Dhamma, relatives in the Sangha. And as Buddhists, before we do anything, before we undertake any important action, we pay respects. And in Thai the word is to grab prat, to pay respects to prat means something venerable. Now in Thai prat can mean uh, senior monks, you have uh, village monks, forest monks, different sects, or, or holy objects. But this isn't what we mean. There's the one thing that we all bow down to, the highest venerable of all is the venerable Lord Buddha. Having venerated the Venerable Lord Buddha, we bow down to the Venerable Dhamma and then bow down to the Venerable Sangha. And having done that, then we can begin any wholesome spiritual activity, any ceremony. The Buddha was Indian, but that's not important. It doesn't matter where the Supreme, fully enlightened one was from, whether he was a man, whether he was a woman. Being a Buddha is about spiritual qualities. And these are spiritual qualities, these are universally accepted. And these spiritual qualities cultivated by the Buddha preceded him. It's not that the Buddha invented them. In, in Pali, the word is Tamma Tittata. That means established firmly on the Dhamma. Tamma Niyamata. This means that Dhamma is a fixed, unchanging law. His teachings, which he uh, taught over 45 years. He taught in very many different ways, in different places, to different people. But it's not that you have to read and memorize all these thousands of teachings that the Buddha gave over these 45 years. Dhamma, Lung Cha used to compare it to medicine in a hospital. Everybody goes to a hospital for the same reason. No matter what their sickness is, they're all going for the same reason. That's for the doctor to check them, to diagnose them, and give them the right medicine. And that hospital has many, many different medicines, and each individual has a specific medicine for their sickness. So when the doctors diagnose them, he gives them the right medicine. You don't have to go to hospital and take every medicine available in the hospital. If you did that, the medicine would kill you. And so Dhamma is the same. 
You don't have to memorize and apply every Dhamma teaching. What Dhamma means, simply summed up, is to be awake and to fully understand and to know, to know and see. And when we see in line with the, with, with the, the laws of nature, we will be quick to abandon anything that leads to our harm, to our danger, which leads to darkness. We'll adapt and improve and change our lives in a way where we develop wholesome qualities instead. The Buddha had fully cultivated wholesome spiritual qualities. Whatever he did was for the welfare and the happiness of the world. This word, the world, the Buddha used it a lot. He, he, he would often say that Dhamma is a protector of the world, a loka bala. Non-harming leads to happiness in the world. So what does this mean, world? Dhamma is a protector of the world. Used, used commonly or in a normal sense, you can look around and see, well, the world has trees, rocks, uh, various things in the outside world. But that's not just how the Buddha used it. The Buddha talked about the world of elements. That's another meaning. The Buddha um, defined it even more. It could div uh, divide up rocks and trees and things that we can see into earth element, fire element, uh, water element, and, and air or wind element. But that doesn't include consciousness. So when we look deeper at the Buddha's meaning of the word, we always have to include consciousness. So we could use, instead of loka dhatu, elements, we could call the world the kanda loka, the world of the kanda, or the, the aggregates, the, the properties that make us a, a being, which includes the aggregate of vinyana, consciousness. Vinyana is that which really, you could say it rules the world. It controls our lives. It directs our actions of body and speech and is how the veil through which we interpret and understand the external world. But because we are still grounded in ignorance, we lead our lives in a, often in a very chaotic and confused way, which is why the Buddha said, Dhamma, is a protector of the world. And when he says this, he means mano dhamma, mano tham. Dhammas, the qualities of the mind, our intentional thoughts. So, in our in our Buddhist in, in our text, the, the the books we study, um, particularly for new monks, there's a, a book Nawakowada, the instructions for new monks. One of the very first things you learn is this concept, loka bala. A Dhamma is a protector of the world. How, how, do we, how do we cultivate Dhamma as a protector of the world or as a protector for ourselves? By inclining the mind towards the Buddha's teachings through cultivating two very important um, Dhamma properties or qualities. Hiri, which is Pali for a sense of shame with regard unwholesome activity, and otappa, which means a, a wise knowing or a wise fear of the consequences, the future consequences of unwholesome actions. So a sense of fear or shame or, 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 or drawing away from unwholesomeness through clearly understanding the dangerous future results, the results of Gamma. Hiri, or a sense of shame, really it's something which we can feel in our, in our hearts and we can experience directly for ourselves. It's not, it's about, it's that feeling we have of remorse when we make mistakes, when we do that which is wrong, those things which are, you could call them cancerous in our lives. And these are the things which come from avicca, from not knowing. This avicca, this not knowing or ignorance is what leads us to make mistakes in our life. And so this is dangerous for our minds. So the Buddha taught us that when we live in line with his teaching, we have to develop hiri, a sense of shame or a gut, a gut uh, 
drawing, pulling away, turning away from unwholesome things. And otapa, clearly knowing and understanding the consequences. And if we have this, we'll be okay. If we know, if we, if we don't have hiri, if one is shameless, then whatever we do or say will be grounded in, in unwholesome states of mind. These unwholesome states have to be abandoned. And if we haven't abandoned unwholesome states of mind, if we don't dare to do this, then no matter how many Dhamma teachings we've heard or desanas we listen to, they will all be of no use. So we have to abandon wrong view. And with the abandoning of wrong view, this gives to light and vision. It's about choosing the right path which we have to take in order to survive in life. Foster and cultivate the strength of sati, mindfulness, which leads to sampajanya, clear comprehension. And wherever, whenever you have sati leading to sampajanya, panya, wisdom, must surely follow. As the Buddha described the Eightfold Path, he taught it as sila, leading to samadhi, leading to panya, panya being the highest or the fruition of the path. Wisdom, panya, it's the jewel of wise people. It leads to path and fruit. And so this word Buddha means awake and holy. So now today on this occasion, all of us have come here today, the purpose being to enshrine Buddha relics. Buddha relics are uh, material objects which are representations of the Buddha. Sometimes people wonder, are they really real? Are they really relics of the Buddha? But it's not something we can discuss. There's no end to this kind of discussion and speculation. What we have to think of them, we have to think of them as uh, Dhamma Tatu, as elements of nature and representations of Buddha Dhamma. We see them as objects representing the Buddha and installing them in this jedi, which has Buddha images, representation of the Buddha himself. And having done that, we can say this is the completion of the external ceremony, the external act of enshrining Buddha relics. But for this ceremony to be really complete, we have to enshrine the Dhamma Dhatu, the elements of Dhamma, in our minds and hearts. Enshrining, enshrine then the Buddha Dhamma in our minds means that we ourselves become the ones who know. We do know things already. We know some things, but not on a deep enough level. We still often don't know what's beneficial and what's harmful. We often do, we often think that good things are harmful and that harmful things are good things. Sometimes people do things, they say, I'm going to make merit, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But the things they do, thinking they're making merit, are still not fully in line with the Buddha's teachings because we still don't fully understand the principles of the Dhamma. So one of our great Thai teachers who's passed away now, Ajahn Buddha Dasa, he used to say quite simply that unless sila and dhamma is restored or is brought back or flourishes again in society, the world will collapse. If sila dhamma does re-arise or is re restored and flourishes in society, then the world can be cool, can be peaceful. Sila dhamma is our life. If life has no sila dhamma, then simply put, that person's life is no different from that of an animal's. And a harmful animal at that. Our speech, our actions, will, will carry a deadly poison with them, both in private and in public, to others and ourselves. And this is what you can see all around in the world, here in Thailand too. Without Sila Dhamma, Happiness in society is just not possible. So today, in order to properly enshrine relics, we have to enshrine sila, virtue, and dhamma, truth, and cultivate hiri, a sense of shame towards that which is unwholesome, and utapa, 
the wise understanding of the results of unwholesome actions. So study these two things. See their clear relationship with Sila Dhamma. And if you do this, you will see for yourselves the truth of the Buddha's teachings. As a result, metta will arise in your hearts. And metta is what we need. So often these days you see husband and wife having taken their vows, are unable to, to walk the whole journey in life together. They can't live together and they separate. Older brothers and sisters fight with their younger brothers and sisters. Parents and children fight with one another. So there's no love there. True love has metta, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion. Cultivate the baramis, dana barami, sila barami, these spiritual qualities. And what we've been doing here, the Kripa Ajahn, the, the, the monks giving talk, talks, is our offering, our dana of giving dhamma. It's what we call dhamma dana. And it brings light into the world, light into our lives. In the same way that light was brought into Anya Kondanya, the Buddha's first enlightened disciple. He received the light of wisdom from the Buddha and that generation of enlightened disciples passed on the flame of wisdom from one generation to the next of enlightened teachers until this generation, Lumpur Man, Lumpur Cha. And this is our job. The job of the Sangha, the Krupa Ajahn, is to teach how people can live a life in peace, to know what causes lead to what results. So today, we are enshrining Buddha relics, but last night, the Kruba Ajahn were enshrining Dhamma relics. You could call the teachings Dhamma relics in your hearts. And now I'm adding a bit more to this. It's my way of paying you back for a nice meal just now. I want to speak of, of effort and explain what, what putting forth right effort is in your life. Right effort can be divided into two areas. There's right effort with regard wholesome states of mind and right effort with regard unwholesome states of mind. So first the unwholesome states. Right effort with regard unwholesome states is called sangwara padana, means the effort to restrain the mind to guard the mind so as unwholesome states don't arise in the mind. And then pahana padana. Pahana means abandoning. Any unwholesome states that have arisen, we put forth effort to, to abandon them. And with regard wholesome states or good qualities, we have bhavana padana. Bhavana means cultivation or development. Cultivate wholesome states of mind. And then those wholesome states having, an, having arisen, anurakana padana. Anurakana means to nurture or to foster, to look after those wholesome states of mind that have already arisen. So today, all of you have come here from different parts to enshrine Buddha relics, but also enshrine these Dhamma relics in your hearts. Have the humility to accept the Dhamma. Today then I wish you, wish that everybody here is able to um, lift, lift up, raise up the quality of all of your lives so that you're free from all fear, free from all enmity, free from doubts through having the Buddha Dhamma firmly established in your heart. Puttaratana, Dhammaratana, Sangharatana, the jewel of the Buddha, the jewel of the Dhamma, the jewel of the Sangha. These are the brightest and most valuable jewels in the world. So may all of you delight in your own barami, your own spiritual um, qualities that you're cultivating today and the barami that you've cultivated in the past, the barami that you've cultivated in previous lives, and the barami that you will cultivate in the future and in future lives. This we call your stream of merit. 
May all the wholesome actions that everybody has undertaken be a cause, be a condition, and be a blessing for all of you to practice Dhamma and realize the Dhamma in a way which leads to true safety. And may you all ultimately realize your each and every one of your own uh, deepest heart's aspiration. Sato, Sato.